Matcha has become a popular drink all around the world, but all these cups of tea started out at one point as leaves. In this video, we're going to be covering the complete story of matcha, from leaf to cup. We'll see how farmers in Japan cultivate and harvest the tea plants, and we'll also see how tea masters prepare some of the best cups of matcha tea. Hopefully by the end of this, you'll appreciate this wonderful green beverage even more. Before we get started, it would really mean a lot to us if you could subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay tuned for future tea videos. We have hundreds of videos on all sorts of topics related to Japanese green tea, but for this episode, we're going to focus on matcha specifically. If at any point in time you are curious about trying some matcha tea for yourself. You can follow some of the links below to try out our assortment of matcha tea. Without further ado, let's get started. Like all types of true teas, matcha comes from the tea plant, Camellia sinensis. Contrary to popular belief, herbal infusions coming from other plants like chamomile and peppermint are not actually teas, but rather tisans. While there are only two major types of tea plants used to make tea, sinensis and asamica, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of sub-varieties called cultivars. These cultivars are analogous to wine varietals. Each cultivar has a slightly different flavor profile and prefers a different climate. Southern Japan tends to produce sweeter matcha teas because the milder winters allow for more delicate cultivars to flourish. These delicate cultivars like saimidori and okumidori produce smoother and sweeter flavors than the frost-resistant yabukita that is so dominant in the north. If normal tea leaves were ground into a powder, the taste would be incredibly bitter. To make matcha taste good in powdered form, it has to go through a long and labor-intensive production process. This process begins three weeks before the harvest, when the tea farmers begin to cover the tea plants with a special type of netting called a kabuse. This prevents the tea plants from being exposed to the sunlight. When tea plants are exposed to sunlight, they begin to convert theanine into catechins. These catechins offer the tea plant protection from the UV light, but they produce a bitter flavor in the finished tea. When the tea plant is cut off from sunlight, it stops producing catechins and it's able to maintain more of its sweet and savory theanine. Theanine is the amino acid in green tea that is thought to be responsible for the calming effect the drink can have. It works in synergy with the caffeine in order to buffer some of its negative side effects. It slows the absorption of caffeine, so rather than getting a rapid jolt of energy and a crash later on in the day, matcha tends to give you a long-lasting, calm alert feeling for many hours after drinking it. After the three weeks of shading, the tea plant is ready to be harvested. The leaf selection here is very important, as different leaves on the tea plant will produce different flavors. The older, more mature leaves lower down on the tea plant aren't quite as flavorful or as nutrient-dense as the young sprouts on top of the tea plant. These older tea leaves will be used to produce teas like bancha, genmaicha, and hojicha, while the younger sprouts of the tea plant will be used for premium teas like matcha, gyokuro, and sencha. These younger leaves are also higher in caffeine, which is one of the many reasons why matcha is so high in caffeine. After the tea leaves are picked, they are gathered up to be processed. To understand the processing of matcha tea, you first have to understand what green tea is. Teas are broken up into six different categories based on their processing style. You have six basic types of teas including white tea, yellow tea, green tea, oolong tea, red or black tea, and dark tea. The two most well-known are perhaps black teas, which are fully oxidized, and green teas, which are unoxidized. After the leaves have been picked, they will begin to oxidize naturally and eventually turn into a black tea. During this oxidation process, the catechins in the tea leaf are converted into theoflavins and theorubigans. The tea trades these fresh vegetable notes for warmer notes of caramel or chocolate. If a farmer wants to lock in the natural green color and flavor of the tea, he will need to apply heat to the tea leaves after the harvest. This deactivates the enzyme oxidase and it prevents the oxidation process from taking place. All green teas need to be heated within a few hours after being picked, otherwise they will start to drift into the direction of a black tea. Because matcha is a type of Japanese green tea, the steaming method is preferred. This steam bath gives the tea leaves that green color and steamed vegetable flavor that Japanese green teas are known for. The steam is only applied for between 40 and 80 seconds, and then the leaves are brought into the drying stage. Perhaps the most difficult part of the tea production process is bringing the moisture content of the leaves down. The freshly picked tea leaves start out at 70% moisture, and they need to be brought down to between 4 and 7% in order to infuse properly. This is done through a slow, gradual process of heating. If the heat applied to the tea leaves is too high, the leaves would cook and take on a roasted flavor like hojicha. That's why the heat needs to be applied at a very low level for a longer time. After the leaves have gone through several drying phases, they are ready for the next stage. One of the things that makes matcha unique is that it actually has its stems removed. These yellowish stems don't produce as much of that sweet and savory flavor most people look for in a matcha, so they have to be removed before the grinding. There are a few different ways to accomplish this. There are machines that automatically separate the stems from the leaves and sort them out. 
The method we see being used by most matcha producers is a bit more complicated than that. The producer will actually put the leaves through a series of nets and blow air underneath them. Because the leaves are lighter and catch more wind than the stems, they will float higher and be separated into the next chamber. This may seem like a complicated method, but it ends up working in the end. The tea leaves with the stems removed are referred to as tencha, and they are one step away from becoming matcha. Now all that remains is the grinding. You may be thinking that you can just use any old mill to grind the tea leaves into powder, but as we learned at a family-run tea farm in Shizuoka, this is not the case. A small hand mill like this has only a small network of grooves, and therefore it's not able to grind the tea into a super fine powder, but rather a pretty coarse dust. If you really want to make premium matcha, you need one of these large granite mills, like you find here on the farm of Mr. Sakamoto. These mills have a large network of grooves, which push the tencha leaves through as they are ground into a finer and finer powder. The end result is a super smooth matcha powder. Hopefully now you understand why most premium matcha comes with such a high price tag. In order to produce it the right way, you will need to follow a lot of steps. If these steps are skipped, you end up with a cheaper tea, but the color will be yellowish brown, the flavor will be extremely bitter, and the tea won't even produce a proper foam. Speaking of the foam, let's talk about the final step in the journey of matcha from leaf to cup, and that's preparing the tea. The goal here is to produce a super smooth bowl of matcha with no clumps and a nice light green foam on top. This foam is more than just for looks. It also aerates the tea, giving it a smoother consistency and taste. Let's learn how to make it. First, take two grams of matcha powder and sift it into a bowl. For this, we will be using the chawan, the handmade clay bowl used in the Japanese tea ceremony. When you sift the matcha powder, you are removing the clumps that form naturally as the matcha is exposed to the humidity in the air. These clumps don't mix as evenly into the water, so if you really want to have a smooth, consistent drinking experience, you will want to remove these. Once you have a layer of finely sifted powder on the bottom of the bowl, you are ready to add the water. For matcha, it's best to use a temperature between 60 to 70 degrees Celsius. If you go too cold with the water, it may be harder to mix, and if you go too hot, the tea will become bitter. We like to start by adding 10 milliliters of water and making it into a paste. This is another precautionary step that makes the matcha mix more evenly into the water and allows you to manage any additional clumps that form. Once you have the paste, you can start to mix in the rest of the warm water, 100 milliliters total and start to scrape off the sides of the tea bowl to combine all the matcha into the bowl. For this, we are using the bamboo tea whisk, or chasen. This is the tool used in the Japanese tea ceremony. It's carved out of a single piece of bamboo, and it's the perfect tool for whisking up matcha. When you watch tea masters prepare matcha tea, they move the bamboo whisk through the matcha in a rapid zigzag motion using the wrist. After a few seconds of whisking, a beautiful foam starts to form on top of the matcha, and after about 30 seconds, the matcha is ready. The tea can either be drunk directly out of the bowl or poured into a cup to be enjoyed. So there you have it, the complete journey of matcha from leaf to cup. As you can see, there is a lot that goes into producing this magical cup of tea. If you're interested in trying matcha tea for yourself, you can try one of our matcha samplers at neoteas.com. This sampler includes 21 of the best matcha teas we found all over Japan. They represent different cultivars, growing regions, and farms all across the country. What better way to learn about the production of matcha than by comparing different teas side by side to see how differences in the growing and production can lead to vast differences in the flavor of the tea. Thank you all so much for taking the time to watch this video. If you want to watch more videos about Japanese green teas, you can find hundreds of videos on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions about matcha or tea in general, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Until then, we'll see you next time.